Welcome to Riley on Film. I'm your host, Damian Riley. You can find out more and subscribe for free always at RileyOnFilm.com. Now, on with the show. Please listen carefully. just got back from Godzilla King of Monsters and I will tell you that it was too long right off the top uh, some other things is that the characters were not fleshed out I thought the writing was awful the monster stuff totally cool really enjoyed that reminded me of when I was a kid and I used to watch Mothra and Rodan and all those guys so it was definitely there at times but when you've got a movie that's two hours and 12 minutes you've got a movie that's saying I am the shit whatever I do is gonna be a hit and you can't be like that especially when you're respecting a tradition time-honored tradition of Godzilla and this just looked like you know a bunch of people from modern movies and TV getting together to run around and talk BS with each other and have some monsters. It really didn't have a story. The story that it did have was so far-fetched and I'm sorry that I'm being so hard on this film, but I mean, you know, I was expecting a lot more. Okay, so I get excited. Let me start again. The film is Godzilla, King of the Monsters. Came out in 2019, actually in May, so it's fairly new. And it has hit the public with mixed impressions. It is rated PG-13, which I think is a perfect rating because the kind of audience you're going to be attracting is not only uh, action, suspense type adults, but also some uh, creature feature like uh, Jurassic Park in the younger crowd. So it was a good rating, PG-13. I always hate to see turning these things into R movies so they have to put these terrible things in them and then kids see them and then it's just a it gets to be a big mess so I think PG-13 was a good one like I said it's two hours 12 minutes it's being called action adventure fantasy definitely not horror Uh, I'm just covering it because it has monsters in it and monsters qualify as horror in my book anyway so what's it about the cryptozoological agency monarch faces off against a battery of god-sized monsters including the mighty godzilla who collides with mothra rodan and his ultimate nemesis the three-headed king Ghidorah. the director and writer here is michael doherty and i just want to let fans of his know that i think he he held the responsibility with this movie and he totally dropped the ball in it being too long and he totally dropped the ball in some of the actors that he picked to cast in it and he totally dropped the ball in writing the screenplay what he did well were the effects Godzilla looks awesome Rodan comes out of a freaking hot lava pit and is flying through the sky with this hot lava coming off his wings I mean it's it's something to see so here's what Michael Doherty's done. He did Trick or Treat, which was a fun little scary uh, compilation movie. Krampus, not very good. Superman Returns, 2006. I didn't find anything special about Superman Returns, but apparently he had done enough for people to give him all the money and all the rights to make a movie about our favorite monster, Godzilla. So that's Michael Doherty, the director. Before I get into the stars, let's go ahead and listen to the trailer for this monster film. What we are witnessing here is the return of Titans. Please listen carefully. How many of these things are there? 17 and counting. That's messed up. Mothra. 
through them. Jidora. Oh my. They're moving like a pack. They're hunting. They all respond directly to an alpha. We stop this Ghidorah, we stop them all. Is there another creature that might stand a chance against him? Oh, yeah, sure. Let's bring him in for a beer. No, this time we join the fight. Run. spend a little extra time on cast because I have to say I have not been this frustrated by a cast in a long time now I always hold it open there maybe I was in a bad mood but no this goes beyond my bad mood in fact I wasn't even in a bad mood till I watched this movie so let me talk to you a little bit about what's going on here okay you have Kyle Chandler he is the daddy scientist that has been so interested in Godzilla that he left his family for it and for other reasons just basically became an absentee dad uh, was played by Kyle Chandler who is in Bloodline personally I don't find him to be that interesting of an actor uh, I'm not sure why he was chosen as the leading man the next one Vera Farmiga okay she is Dr. Emma Russell. She is the mommy scientist that wants to make the earth pure for these monsters. Then was the surprise for me to see, and I thought, how fun. The girl from Stranger Things, Millie Bobby Brown. They brought her in and they made her the daughter. Someone's sleeping in my daughter's bed. No. I just can't tell you how disappointed I was in these three. And these three are the supposed family that studies Godzilla. Uh, I think if you look at the old Godzillas, you don't see people like getting all emotional about studying Godzilla. They just do it because he's attacking and so they have to figure him out. These people are like obsessed and willing to give their lives and I won't go any further than that because I don't want to give away spoilers but yeah so Kyle Chandler, Vera Farmiga, Millie Bobby Brown very poor casting choices they just don't work together I don't care how big Stranger Things is and how cute the girl you think is now that she has hair on her head and Vera Farmiga just has been all over the place in so many things but is not convincing in this role as Dr. Emma Russell. I am very sorry to say that, but that's how it is with me. So, the only other one I really want to talk about, because nothing, nothing's really, like, horribly bad. Like, for example, Sally Hawkins. She plays Dr. Vivian Graham, one of the other doctors. And she's not too bad. Of course, she dies. Oh! Wait. Blah. Yeah. Spoiler. Sorry. I'll have to get that out. Sorry if I left it in. But you're not missing much. Anyways, um... Let's get back to the one guy that I wanted to discuss, and his name is Bradley Whitford. He plays Dr. Rick Stanton. I think that uh, they just wanted Dennis Hopper, but he wasn't available, so they tried to make 
Bradley Whitford into Dennis Hopper character and he ain't even a fraction of that cool. And you know what? It got me thinking about how I, I have never really liked Bradley Whitford in anything. I didn't like the entire movie of Get Out and I know that gets me in trouble with a lot of people but I just thought it was a meh kind of movie. People say, oh, it's amazing horror, you know. Well, okay, not to me. But Bradley in that was terrible, and I think he took a lot from that movie. Uh, in this this one here with Godzilla, I think he's terrible in this too. So people, stop hiring Bradley Whitford. He's not a very good actor, and uh, he's definitely not Dennis Hopper, which is obviously what they were trying to create, that kind of a cool hippie guy that's got it all together, and now he's a scientist. And yeah, I just, I saw where they were going, and they just had the wrong guy out to take you on the journey. I really wanted to like Godzilla, King of the Monsters, but it was just too darn long. If they could just chop off the first hour, which is totally unnecessary, and if you want to just piece the little pieces where they do show the monsters and add those to the very beginning, it might have worked better. Okay, so that's what I was watching today. Now let's get into some other stuff that I've been watching this past couple weeks. Gremlins 2, the new batch. Well, I don't think anybody's expecting an Oscar from this one. It is rated PG-13, uh, which I'm glad because, you know, you'd hate to make a Gremlins movie that was rated R. And then you have all these young kids going to rated R movies and having nightmares at night but the gremlins are cute the gremlins are fun and they're back again in gremlins 2 this is called a comedy fantasy horror i don't know that i would call it a horror so much you know the horror word and label gets thrown around a lot on internet movie database and just within the uh, confines of rating movies i think if that's maybe they can bring in some fringe people that really like horror movies might be but so many of them are mislabeled we're gonna look at a few of those today Gremlins 1 was just a classic great film uh, brought on the scene by Steven Spielberg Joe Dante and made into something that is just a cultural icon Gizmo the cute one and then the evil ones that they kill in interesting and uh, disgusting ways who can forget the time they put one into microwave oven and set it going and blew one of them up inside there i mean that's just stuff you don't forget so we have zach gilligan we have phoebe cates in her beautiful self she actually looks a little younger in this one i think it's because of her haircut and speaking of uh who can forget uh the scene by the pool in fast times at ridgemont high anyone 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 so everybody knows that scene, though, who's about my age. And Gremlins 2, you know, it, it's got some beautiful women in it, but nothing like that. I think the Phoebe Cates uh, of Fast Times at Ridgemont High will never be forgotten. So on a scale of 1 to 10, I had to give this one a 6 out of 10. 7, 8, 9, and 10 are all reserved for movies that really do something and definitely nudge me in the right direction, give me a good film experience. This one did, but not quite. But moving right along to my next film, which is Fire in the Sky of 1993. This is another PG-13 one, definitely scary. I have read online that many people say that the abduction scene from this film is one of the scariest scenes they've ever seen in a movie, period, horror or otherwise. And they actually didn't call this one horror, so I gotta hand it to them for that. I think it all depends on who they're trying to attract. Because this one, they call it a biography. Apparently, all these guys in the mine had this same experience. And they shared it with cops in different rooms and stuff. So, it's supposed to be real. But, I, of course, have my issues with it. Because I'm not really into the whole Roswell thing. I don't think that there have been visits to our planet by greys. So, what do you think of that? Let me know your opinion. It was still fun to watch this, though. The basic story is an Arizona logger mysteriously disappears for five days in an alleged encounter with a flying saucer 
1975. Again, it's called Fire in the Sky from 1993. So we have this account of what happened, this abduction, this alien landing and such. And we make it into a movie. And the movie stars D.B. Sweeney, a very young-looking Robert Patrick. Craig Sheffer, who doesn't do much in this film other than just kind of leer at people. It's kind of funny, actually. Craig Sheffer gets a bad rap, though. I, I think he, he could have he met more of his potential in films. My favorite movie of all time, of dramas, is When a River Runs Through It. And uh, Craig Sheffer, actually I think it's just called A River Runs Through It, No Wind. But Craig Sheffer is the main character in that, and he's amazing. He plays like a younger Robert Redford, really good. So yes, there is fire in the sky, there are effects. There is a really creepy, scary scene, of course, quite dated by now. This is from 93, so this is a ways back, late 90s. It's really amazing the more films that I watch with all these effects, and I think we have come so far. But what more can we do now? That's really the question. I think the answer is get back to the story. Pay attention to the story more than the effects. And whatever we can come up with will tell the story better. But we should always be a slave to the story, not to the effects. This one gets a little bit over its head, I think, a few times. With the eyes of the aliens blinking and such. And, uh... I don't know that I will from here on out, or that I even have. I don't think I have, though. I'm giving you spoilers, so I just want to give you a warning like I usually do. It says it on the website, I think. But uh, there will be spoilers in this episode. So I had to give this one a 5 out of 10. It wasn't really my cup of tea. It's really hard for me to suspend disbelief about aliens, and so I think that's where it suffered with me. Next is The Girl in the Spider's Web. This is rated R. For good reason. Quite gruesome. You know, all these books that were written by this guy are very gross and very, uh, just, you know, gory, I guess. Rape. Lots of rapes. And they're motherfucking long, too. I can't believe how long they make these movies. This one was two hours. I think it could have been cut back a bit an hour and a half, easily. Please listen carefully. Uh, it's labeled action, crime, drama. Definitely is all those things. I enjoyed it more than I thought I would. It's definitely a good movie, but something feels like it's just missing. It's like everybody keeps trying to make the, these books into movies and be successful at it, and nobody's doing it, so... I don't think the girl in the spider's web really did the author any service. Rest his soul. He's passed away. But it is a good film on its own. Definitely enjoyed it. Kind of a female form of a, of a spy uh, instead of a, a man. And uh, sort of a Mission Impossible type thing. Just opening a can of whoop-ass on uh, womanizing men, too. And that's really popular now. I think to be a white male right now is sort of like the lowest position you can occupy in the universe. And the girl in the spider's web reminds us of that. Uh, and I did enjoy it. It was pretty good. So young computer hacker Lisbeth Salander and journalist Michael Blomkovitz find themselves caught in a web of spies, cyber criminals, and corrupt government officials. Stars Claire Foy. Yay, Claire! I'm holding out for Claire. I think she's going to have a really big movie soon. And that is about covers it for that one, so let's move on. Infliction from 2014. All I'm going to say is, if you're going to do found footage, don't film every nuance of whatever goes on. I mean, because that just makes it so obvious that it's not found footage. I don't know what else to say. Raise your hand if you agree with me. These found footage films that just set out and they're getting people from every angle, every possible lighting. It doesn't happen that way. If you've got one handheld camera, all you're seeing is this one uni view. And we get tons. They try to fix that by showing that they taped GoPros and stuff up in the car, but 
No way, guys. You still gotta press the play button on those things, then you gotta turn it off. How are you gonna remember how many are on at one time? It's just... And then once you get it done, are you gonna edit it all together so somebody could find your footage? I just was pretty cynical about this one, so I had to give it a 4 out of 10. To be honest with you, I didn't even finish it. It's pretty bad. In 2011, two brothers documented their murder spree in North Carolina. This is the actual assembled footage. They must say that like three times in the opening. The actual assembled footage. First of all, how could they get away with saying that when it's clearly not true? Second of all, do they think that scares us? Maybe it does. Okay, moving on to my next film. This one is called The Car from 1977. So much fun. This is prior to Stephen King's Christine. It's a similar concept. A car that is just running people over. It's done very well. For a limited effects budget, they went for the story as important and they didn't go for worrying about the effects so much. But I mean, this car just flattens people and it's scary. And you feel it. Even though it's funny in camp sort of at times. I mean, for God's sake, you've got James Brolin just brooding into the camera, crying a lot. They have the guy crying all the time. And these other characters that are police officers and sheriffs, they're all crying because all their co-workers and friends have all been run over by this car. They don't know what to do. They're at the car's mercy. So it does kind of veer off the road, so to speak, and it's hard to follow towards the end. But all in all, I find it a hilarious movie. I wouldn't recommend it as a date flick unless you have a really open-minded date that's into stupid movies. But it was a lot of fun for somebody like me. But because of the not having universal appeal, I gave it a 6 out of 10. This next one is called Bubba Ho-Tep. Apparently, a Ho-Tep is a mummy spirit that came from Egypt and now roams the earth. A Bubba is someone who grew up in a trailer park. Thus the name, Bubba Hotep. Very, very odd film. Sort of funny. You gotta just kind of have the... I think Bruce Campbell is so well liked by his fans that, you know, anybody who likes Bruce Campbell is going to love this film. But I felt it was a little slow at times and hard to stay with it. It's described as Elvis Presley and a black JFK stay in a nursing home where nothing happens until (laughs) we can stop there no until a wayward Egyptian mummy comes and sucks out the old people's souls through their a-holes the two decide to fight back so some of you out there I can already tell with your type of humor you're already on board go for it enjoy it I didn't sink it but I brought it down a little bit because it was kind of a waste of my day watching it but i gave it a six out of ten don't forget bubba hotep okay a few more eden log eden log 2007 what an interesting film this was a man wakes up deep inside a cave suffering amnesia he has no recollection of how he came to be here or what happened to the man whose body he finds beside him tailed by a mysterious figure And then you'd have to go into the full spoilers mode to see what happens next. But, yeah, this reminds me of, like, in Lord of the Rings when the orcs are being born and they're breaking the membranes and their bony faces are coming out. It's it's like that. It's also when the evil gremlin is killed at the end of Gremlins and he keeps pumping back up. Reminded me of that, too. There's a lot of cool imagery I don't think I can tell you 100% what it's about, even though I watched it all the way through. But for the visuals, it's fun. He wakes up in this cave, so that's... We can all kind of relate with that. If we woke up in a cave, there's a dead guy next to us. I mean, what what the hell? You know, you have to figure that out. And that's what happens here. It's a horror mystery sci-fi. I gave this one a higher score than the others. I gave it a 7 out of 10. One missed call... People mysteriously start receiving voicemail messages from their future selves foretelling their deaths. I thought that this reminded me so much of uh, Final Destination. Very similar to that. And I know that came later, I think. So, obviously, that 
probably borrowed some stuff from this one. Not in an overt way, but just interesting way. I usually don't like movies like that where you find out about your death and all that. I don't know why, I just never really like those. But One Miss Call is okay, it's not bad, it really holds your attention. I gave it a 7 out of 10. Now finally, for my last film I'll be reviewing for you, I want to talk to you about a film called Testament from 1983. The life of a suburban American family is scarred after a nuclear attack. And yes, it is very well made. It reminds me of a zombie movie from today like The Walking Dead, only there's no zombies and the people are just dying of the nuclear reactor. I think in my last episode I talked about Chernobyl, the TV miniseries through HBO and HBO to go. That is an amazing show. I highly recommend watching it. Very entertaining. Uh, Even a little horror thrown in there. But it is a realistic story. And Testament is similar to that because it's showing a disaster, but uh, definitely has that sort of 70s pull. It was definitely preaching to a 70s crowd. And sometimes in those kinds of movies, they're not so universal. And I don't really get it. And that's kind of what happened to me here with Testament. But people really love Testament. And I recommend you check it out. If, if that sounds interesting to you, what would happen in a town if all the families' uh, power was cut off? They had to deal with each other as they're all dying from this atomic bomb fallout. Well, that's it for this What I've Been Watching. Again, let's start from the beginning and just read them again so you can remember if there's something I said that made it sound interesting to you. I hope you'll check it out. And then let me know what you think. Because I always like to publish what people write. Thank you for listening to the DRP with Damian Riley. You can visit me on the web at thedrpodcast.com. Thank you for listening to Riley on Film. I'm your host, Damian Riley. You can find out more and subscribe always for free at RileyOnFilm.com. Now, have a great day.